What's it like reading? <laughs> it's all right. Something to do. Nothing to go mad about. Well, if you don't like it, why don't you read Tubbs' postcards? Because I've read them, and they're worse than a book. <laughs> read them for me again, then. Oh, blimey. All right. Which one do you want to hear? The one from Grimsby with a picture of the lady fish gutters on the front. <laughs> right. Grimsby. Go in like a bomb. Packed every night. The legitimate theatre is the life. No more variety for me. Send a pair of clean socks and see if my new Astrakhan coat is ready. <laughs> He's doing well, though, isn't he? Seems to be. I would never have believed it. Him, a straight actor. A three weeks correspondence course in the method who's got him away. Read the one from Barnsley. Barnsley. Bigger triumph than Grimsby. Standing room only. Riots at the stage door. A star is born. Fated everywhere. Champagne parties till dawn. P.S. Where are those clean socks? <laughs> well, I'll bet all this will make a difference to him. He'll be mixing with a higher class of people now. He'll probably move into Chelsea with the clever dicks. He's got his reputation to think of now. I hope he does move. As long as he divs up my 10%, he can go where he likes. Aha, what is this I see before me? Two scurvy knaves, perchance, both with their dirty great plates on the table. <laughs> Get them off. Now you're coming home? Obviously. That place is like a pigsty. Nibble Thorndike on the arm. <laughs> Fine impression this would have given her. Oh, sit down and have a bottle of beer. Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, how'd you go last week? What can I... Broke the box office records, four curtain calls last night, crowds outside the stage Yeah, door. never mind about all that old cod's wallop. How much loot did you come away with? <laughs> Fifteen pounds, less me health stamp. Fifteen nigger. Fifteen nigger, that's ten percent of fifteen, that's one thirty bob. Thirty bob? Is that all I get for the week? Thirty bob? I did the work, you've just been lying here scratching yourself. <laughs> I got you to book in, I want more than thirty bob. What you must realise, Sydney, is that straight actors do not earn the same money as comedians. It's a completely different line of business. Then go back to the comedy. You were earning hundreds at that. Get the red nose and the big boots on and get out and earn some loot. <laughs> Never. I've finished with professional buffoonery. I'm an actor now. People in this country respect you when you don't get laughs. <laughs> they tip their hats when they pass you in the street. Morning, sir, they say. <laughs> sir. Sir. Ah, oh, music. I never got called sir when I was a comic, not once. It was always, aye, aye, big feet, hello, mate. <laughs> well, all come that. It's because they like you. They're being familiar, friendly, they... Don't you want people to be matey with you? No, I don't. don't respect, I want to be aloof. I, I, I want to be considered above it all, unattainable. <laughs> like all the knights of the theatre. People don't get matey with them. They don't call Sir Michael Redgrave big feet when he walks down the street. <laughs> People respect him because they got dignity, you see. I want the old touch of the forelock when I'm being driven down the high street in the back of me Landor. <laughs> I might give him a slight inclination of the head and a few limp hand waves. Yeah, well, don't be surprised if you get a few limp cabbages, too. <laughs> Welcome home, Tub. Thank you, William. Nice to see you home again. Thank you, it's nice to be home. Have you brought the plug television set home with you? Of course. Well, can we have it then to put it on? Certainly, here it is. Why do you have to take our plug with you? Why can't you leave it on the set? I should think so. I'm not having you wearing out my tube. <laughs> I know you. It'll be on all day. From the racing at Cheltenham right through to the national anthem. When I go on tour, the plug goes with me. Oh, which program shall we have it on? I don't care. Well, what do you fancy? With or without advertisements? Uh, adver Yes, well, let's have it, uh... <laughs> let's have it without advertisements tonight. <laughs> Australian buffoon. I'm feeling rather cultural. What's on? Uh, oh, BBC, a Western. Oh, dear. What's on ITA, then? Um, uh, ITA, a Western. I'll put the BBC on. It might be a cultural Western. Right. I'm coming to get you, Wyoming. Oh, stone me. Turn it over to the other lot. I'm a coming to get you, Montana. Well, which one? 
Oh, leave it where it is. He rides a better class of horse on this one. Turn the sound up a bit. Well, you killed him like you said you would, Marshal. Yep, but I don't feel good about it. But he was a killer. He was a man. Don't ever forget that. If the people who are going to come after us are going to this country of ours into a place where decent folk can live in freedom, they got to see that boys like him get a better chance in life. He's soft-hearted, you know. <laughs> He's a fool to himself. They'll get him one day. He never likes killing anybody. 150 he's done in since this program started and he still hasn't got used to it. You, you got to remember there's good in all of us. You just got to dig down inside a man until you find it. He's right, you know, he's dead right. He's got a pair of brains underneath that big hat. There's good in all more deep thinking like that. I suppose you're right, Marshal. Get the boot hill and let's get on back to Dodge. <laughs> Then, is it? I want to see who played that part. Very good. Oh, here it comes. Marshall played by June. No, that was the girl. It's not me they're whipping the credits up quickly. Oh, I've missed them all. Make up by... Well, who cares who made them up? Honestly, why don't they slow down the credits? You see the list of characters? You look along the dots to see who it was and he's gone. Hey, look, the advertisements are starting. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Hello. That bird sitting in the bath covered with soap. <laughs> She's a lovely girl. She'll be coming in the dance hall in a minute, two hours later. <laughs> there you are, there you are. Look, there she is. Oh, done up to the nines. <laughs> There's the bloke who dances with her. <laughs> He's a drip, that one. <laughs> I don't know what she sees in him. I wouldn't waste a bar of soap on him. Hello. Hello, here's a cartoon one. Oh, it's him. <laughs> oh, yes, me on the floor, that little bloke. <laughs> Walks up the side of those buildings. <laughs> All of this, you know, he's a key. He's a car. Hello, hello, here's another one. Fancy him doing adverts. I wouldn't go on an advert. Takes away all your dignity. Why don't you stop rabbiting on about dignity? Well, it does. How can one retain one's dignity blabbing on about frozen peas? <laughs> Will you keep quiet? I never heard one word that man said. I'm just surprised at actors of his standing and things like that. Hello, another cartoon. Hey, this is a new one. I haven't seen this one before. What's it advertising? Cornflakes. <laughs> oh, yeah, he's holding them up so we can see what the cutout is. Oh, a cardboard fort and a red Indian, that's worth having. He'll be telling us how good they are now, and how we're taking chances with our health, not eating them. There he goes. Here you are, then. This is stuff for you lot. Harper's cornflakes. <laughs> Get a plate for this down you, and you won't know what hit you. You'll be jumping about all over the place. Why don't you shut up? I'm trying to listen to this bloke talking. It's not me, it's him on the screen. I haven't said a word. Him? Get away, it was you. It wasn't, I tell you. It was him, listen. Don't forget, then. Every breakfast time, eyes down for a plate full of Harper's. Stone me, I'm being impersonated. Harper's, stone me, you're loving. <laughs> what a liberty, it's a dead ringer for me. He's impersonating me. Now, why don't you buy a packet and make your breakfast time a real <sighs> Harper's half hour? Harper's half hour. Did you hear that? <laughs> How dare they do this to me? I've never been so impersonated in all my life. <laughs> Switch it off. Well, what a sauce. Now, come on, be honest. You've been making adverts on the side, haven't you? All this stuff about dignity. You have been making yourself a few bob on the cornflakes without telling us, trying to do me out of my ten percent. I tell you, I don't know anything about it. I wouldn't lend my name to a thing like that. Your name wasn't mentioned. It was just your voice. Hoping I wouldn't know it was you. It wasn't me. How much money did you get for it? I didn't get any money for it. What did they pay in cornflakes? <laughs> for the last time, it's nothing to do with me. It's somebody impersonating me. Ah, oh, well, it doesn't make any difference. It makes a lot of difference. I wouldn't mind so much if they were good cornflakes. <laughs> I've tried those things. They're terrible. No noise at all when you pour the milk on. <laughs> Oh, 
complete silence. Not a peep out of them. You just lie there and soak it up. Well, I take a very serious view of this. Nobody asked my permission. Could well make me the laughing stock of the entire theatre. I'll take all my dignity away from me. Of course it won't. Nobody will realise it's you. It's not me. Well, they won't realise it sounds like you. Well, we'll see. I'm at Scarborough next week. We'll soon see what the public reaction is. <laughs> Marguerite, it is you. They let you come to the prison to see me. Oh, my darling, what have they done to you? Come, Marguerite, courage. You've been good to me. What can I do? What can I give you my appreciation? Give her a package! <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. I don't mind the space there. Have one for the fire, please! <laughs> do you mind, please? Give the artist a freeze. Tis a far, far better thing I do now than I have ever done. Well, it's certainly better than that advertisement. <laughs> oh, this is ridiculous. <laughs> Cut and the curtain. <laughs> I knew it. I knew this would happen. Ruined the whole performance they did. And what about me? You ought to know better. A man in your position stopping to make tatty adverts. Haven't you got any artistic integrity? Have a care, madam. You're talking to the star. Dame Edith Evans has been after your part, you know. Oh, well. <laughs> she can have it. I've never been so humiliated in all my life. Arpers, cornflakes. Well, it was nothing to do with me. Well, here comes the manager. I bet he'll have something to say to you. All right, Hancock, here's your money. I'm paying you off. I beg your pardon? You heard. I run a straight theatre here. My regular patrons are being complaining. But I didn't do the advert. It was your voice. That's good enough for me. Ruined. A brilliant career struck down by a packet of cornflakes. <laughs> well, we'll see about this. I shall sue for damages. <laughs> Will rise, case number 12 on the list Hancock versus Harper's Cornflakes, Mr. Justice Spooner presiding. Continue. The plaintiff is suing the defendants for damages suffered to his professional reputation and loss of subsequent earnings due to an alleged impersonation of his voice in a television advertisement. I see. Well, who's going to start? Uh, may we have the case for the plaintiff, please? My lord! <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, my client is a world-famous celebrity. I've never heard of him. Well, he's quite well known. His case in a nutshell is that the defendants used an impression of his voice without his knowledge or permission, and it has made him the laughing stock of his profession and has resulted in loss of engagements and a considerable amount of money. He is claiming copyright on his absence. I beg your pardon? His absence. His absence choice. His voice. <laughs> Would you please consign yourself to expressions in common usage? Well, it's in usage down our way, mate. I don't know where you live. My place of residence is no concern of this court. Besides, I'm certainly not telling a man of your record where I live. Continue. Yes, sir. I call William Billabong Kerr. <laughs> Do you think that's wise? I call William Billabong Kerr. Is your name William Billabong Kerr? Yes, known professionally as Billo the Performing Man. <laughs> I, uh, I do a doctor, and he just sits there and barks, and I do all the tricks. We are not interested in your profession. Get on with it. Mr. Kerr, will you tell the court, in my own words, what happened to 23... <laughs> before that? We opened the bottle. No, 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 before that. <laughs> oh, we went and bought it. I'm not talking about the booze up, son. What happened while we were watching television? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, Mr. Hancock came home after a hard day at the theatre and told us how well he'd done and what a big name he was now. Whereupon, we switched on the telly and we were confronted by... <laughs> which, and by which I could burst his way through to how good they were in Mr. Hancock's voice. Oh, you couldn't have been. He's too... <laughs> because I was sitting next to him and I watched him and his lips didn't move while the little bloke was talking. <laughs> It could have been a record of Mr. Hancock's voice. Uh, um, uh, well, uh, I refuse to answer that question on the grounds that I might incriminate myself. Step down, you ratbag. 
I will now proceed to prove that the voice was not Mr. Hancock's own voice, but a deliberate impersonation. Call Anthony Hancock. Call Anthony Hancock. Are you Anthony Hancock? I am. Did you at any time ever lend your voice to a cornflake advert? Never. Did you ever agree to let anyone else impersonate you for the purposes of making a cornflake advert? Again, I must reply, never. And would you say that the voice on that advert was similar to yours? Similar? A dead ringer, your worship. <laughs> and that's a dead ringer. I was amazed. Flabbergasted is more the word. 100% 22 carat flabbergasted. <laughs> well, if anyone hadn't known different, they would have thought it was me. And thousands of people have subsequently thought that it was, in fact, you that done it. I should say so. It's been a source of great embarrassment to me ever since. Would you tell the court, please, just how this vulgar impersonation has affected your theatrical career? Do I have to? I think the court ought to know. Very well. It's a tale of the utmost woe. Humiliation has been heaped on me. I've been ridiculed from all parts of the house. Prices of the seats has been no barrier. I have been chai from the balcony. <laughs> from the dress circle and from the stalls. And laughed a final indignity. Chai Ike from the raspberry moose and drink on a stick, girls. <laughs> to continue, at Newcastle, on, in my rendition of Hamlet, halfway through the ghost scene, when I was reeling back, saying, What is this I see before me? <laughs> there came from the back of the stalls a distinct cry. A bowl of harpers, mate! <laughs> In Nanook of the North. <laughs> Even the stagehand started taking the mickey. I opened the door of me igloo in the frozen north and walked straight out into a cornflake storm. <laughs> Tell me, Mr. Hancock, what has been the effect on your future engagements? All cancelled. Fifteen managements have cancelled me booking at a person lost to me of earnings amounting to no less than 73 quid. But you're asking for a hundred thousand pounds. Well, they can afford it. I read the papers. Stone me, you can get 50,000 for being hit on the head and not being able to smell your dinner. Your Worship, what my client means is that his star was in the ascendancy. Who knows what gigantic fees I could have been screwing them for now. <laughs> that will be all, Mr. Hancock. You may stand down. Thank you very much, and I'd like to place on record my appreciation for you up on the bench. Yes, you, the one with the wig on. <laughs> You've been most helpful. I know you're going to do your best for me, and if I do all right, you're on a pint of cider in the law court arms afterwards. <laughs> I can't say fairer than that. <laughs> Would you step down, please, and keep quiet? Oh, yes, of course. I will now call the villain of the piece, the man who was responsible for the impersonation of Mr. Hancock's voice. Call Arthur Plowright. Call Arthur Plowright. You are Arthur Plowright of no fixed abode? I am. And what is your speciality? I'm an impressionist. Were you the man who was employed to provide the voice on the Arthur's Cornflake advert? That's right. Did you or did you not make a conscious attempt to impersonate my client? No. Will you demonstrate to the court, please, the voice you use for the advert in question? Read this phrase in that same voice. Good evening, and welcome to Hancock's Half Hour. It's me. You all heard him. That's me. Come on, where's the money? Be quiet. Sit down. I wish to hear a comparison of the two voices. The plaintiff will step up next to Mr. Plowright. You will both hold a conversation with each other. You, Mr. Plowright, using the voice in the advert. Go. How dare you use my voice? I am not using your voice. <laughs> yes, you are. You're it now. I am not. It's a voice I invented. This is ridiculous. It's like looking in a mirror. That is my voice. It's a coincidence. I've never even heard of you. <laughs> Stone as well. Are you asking for a punch up the bracket? <laughs> and that's mine. Up the bracket. <laughs> Who's that? It's up at the Lord Chamber with me now. <laughs> Patented, that is. All right, say this. Hancock's... Hancock's half hour. 150,000. I'd be prized up. It's an open and shut case. I demand justice. Well, you won, Tub. And quite right, too. What a liberty. Pretty about the damages. That's a big drop, you know, from 150,000 to 73 quid. <laughs> Still, I prove my point. That's the main thing. 
and they've put in an injunction against him. He can't use my voice on any more cornflake adverts. I've got my dignity back, if nothing else. And that's all you have got. Well, my acting career is finished, I know, but I've still got my radio show. You have not. Pardon? A bloke from the BBC was in court. He thought the other bloke sounded more like you than you do. <laughs> So he's fired you and booked him instead. They can't do that. How can you have Hancock's half hour with no Hancock? Nobody's going to know the difference. Well, I will. I'll be out of work. No, you won't, boy. I've got a booking for you. Doing what? The voice for some more cornflake adverts. <laughs> Five of a week in it for you. But this Arthur Plowright will be making much more than that doing my job. I'm starting at the bottom again. Well, it's your own fault. You shouldn't have sued him in the first place. But you're my agent. Oh, no, I'm not. I'm his agent now. Tell her. All the best, mate. <laughs> Well, of all that dirty trick. What are you going to do now, Tub? Brush up on my impressions for these adverts. If he can get on by being sued, so can I. Here you are, Edward Everett Horton. Oh, hmm, oh dear, oh. Mm. Oh, thanks, mm hmm. No, that's no good, that's no good at all. Charles Lawton. Mr. Christian, bring me some harpers and I'll have you strung up from the highest yard arm of the British Navy. <laughs> no, Robert Newton. Ah, Jim Lowe. <laughs> Here's your cornflakes, lad. Ha ha, ha ha. That was Hancock's Half Hour, starring Tony Hancock, with Sidney James, Bill Kerr, Anne Lancaster, Peter Goodwright, Ronald Wilson, Jerry Stovin, Wilfred Babbage, and Jack Watson. Theme and incidental music composed and conducted by Wallace Stott. Alan Simpson and Ray Gorton wrote the script, and the production, which was recorded, was by Tom Ronald. Radio England, UK 2. Enter a short idiot. <laughs> Good evening, folks. I commence by walking backwards for Christmas. Why? It's all the rage. <laughs> Next, an excerpt from East Lynn. Dead! Dead! And never called me mother! Perhaps you were a spider. Please remove that false bald woman's wig. And leave myself naked the mating season? <laughs> never! Very well. I sentence you to the highly esteemed goon show. They can go home today. Presenting Wallace Greenstreet and his daring announcement entitled Le Salaire de la Peur. Leading the wages of fear all in England. That's why Jesus. Missing Regiment. Burma, 6th of March, 1956. These Japs can't hold out much longer. Oh, I don't know. This is the 14th year we've been fighting them. <laughs> don't worry, Major. They can't stand much more of your drunken singing and bottle throwing. Oh. I'm only doing my duty, sir. And they'd better surrender soon. We've had no food or pay since that silly telegram. Telegram? Get out. Give it here. Oh. Um, British forces Burma. Japan has surrendered. End of World War II. Book now for World War Three. <laughs> Dated by far. Yes, yes. I, well, I, I've never seen it. Oh, because it was obviously the work of a practical joker. Well, I can... <laughs> I hope it is. Ah, da, da, da. The Japanese officer is attacking us with the white flag, Ure. Dead! <laughs> and it's a new Mark III armor-piercing type white flag. Oh, blimey, I'm off. <laughs> look, 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 don't panic. I'll show that Jeff a thing or two. Help me off with me jumpers now. Oh, Major, off. please. Out of my way. <laughs> look at that. Dear listeners, from the waist downwards, Bloodnock was tattooed with a pair of false legs. <laughs> Facing the wrong way. <laughs> yes, they're all the rage, you know. Ah! Do not shoot. Oh, you... you remember me, Dennis Bloodnock. I will not shoot. <laughs> Come forward, military Japanese gentlemen. But 
Keep your right leg raised. Please. I am General Yakamoto, commander of all inferior Japanese troops in that tree. Well. I'm your Malaga. Request, please. Have unexpectedly run short of ammunition. Please, can we borrow two boxes until the end of the war? You haven't returned our lawnmower yet. I'm very sorry, but have not finished mowing jungle. No. No more credit. Clear off. No, then I'm forced to surrender. Surrender? This means war. Ma? I'm sorry, have no alternative. To whom do we surrender, honorable Japanese military stars, please? Stars? You've got stars? Yes, I got stars. One thousand cans of nitroglycerine. Oh. And two thousand cans of sake. <gasps> sake being potent Japanese rice wine. <laughs> being Japanese rice wine? Yes, sir. Oh. <laughs> I am forced, forced to accept your two thousand cans of sake surrender. Stack it under my bed, will you? Please. Uh, which are your tent, please? The white one with the red cross on it and the uh, three dummy nurses outside. Well, go on. Don't say you don't trust me. I don't trust you. I told you not to say it. <laughs> Hand me my Royal Engineer's saxophone issue type. Quick, Mark. <laughs> What a day this has been. A triumph for British arms. Now, I must inform the war office that after 14 years of fighting, the Japanese army in that tree has finally surrendered. <laughs> Dial on, brave telephone. Send those triumphant electric type impulses athwart the sleeping continents to the automatic type exchanges in London. And list. <laughs> Even now sounds the tinted appellation of the phone bell that will arouse the helmsman of England to whom I carry the victorious news. Back to cheat dogs, I mate. <laughs> yeah, wrong. I shall hurry through to the field of wages. Part do you mind? Do you, do mind? you mind? I'll make this announcement. Thank you, Walt. The fear of wages, part two. The same day, four hours later. Money, 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 little money, 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 money. Oh, yo, 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 yo! Lovely money. It's all the rage. Moriarty, shh. Pull that transparent blind down, you fool. Now, have you sewn that ten thousand pounds into the lining of your socks? Yes. <laughs> then help me get this hundred pounds in fivers under my wig. Right. Oh. <clears throat> Down in your right hand. Uh, back a bit. Uh, right. Uh, my this uh, There. Good man. Any more left? Only this fifty thousand pounds in loose silver. Oh. Now where can I hide that? Uh, I did. Moriarty, say ah. Now, Moriarty, keep your mouth shut. I don't want... Arm Pecor here, Chief Cashier speaking. I'm sorry, I... I'm sorry, yes, I... Yes, <laughs> never, never mind about that. Money, aren't you? We're, we're, we're in the grid card now. Remember the third armored thunderboxes who vanished in Burma ten years ago? Yes, 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 yes. Well, they're still alive. Oh! And that was their commander, Seagoon. Oh, 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 type O! <laughs> but they spent all their back pay. Yes. 40,000 pounds, sophisticated court martial, cashiered, shot it down. Take aim, fire, bang. <laughs> now, don't panic, don't panic. <laughs> My malodorous Gallic Charlie will have to think of something else. Meanwhile, Max Gilray and his chromatic clint. Oh, the horror is the brown power. <laughs>
fight in the jungle encampment of the fourth armored thunderboxes. Dear sirs, I am a keen art student over the age of 21. Please forward me your selection of continental art studies in the plain wrapper. Care of ZM. Quite no! Don't come in for a minute. Don't come in. Abdul, quick, put the screens on my bed. <clears throat> oh, uh, come in, Tito. Thank you. Major, I was just walking backwards for Christmas and I thought... Oh. <clears throat> I beg your pardon, madam. I... Get behind that screen, Gladys. <laughs> Judy, Judy. My wife, you know, yes. It's all lies. We're just good friends, of course. Oh. Major. What, what? Grave type news. I've spoken to Whitehall hmm? and the pay court denied that we're alive. What? I've never had a day's death in my life. <laughs> and what about our ten years back pay? Did you tell them we've been fighting all this time? I did. But they said these Japs we are fighting must be forgeries. You mean they're worthless? They said no bank would cash them. <laughs> well, there's only one way to get our back pay. We must return to England with the entire Japanese army in that tree there. Good, yes. Sergeant Goldberg? Yes, sir. What is it, sir? Uh, I'll root that tree and replant it in the back of a lorry. And try not to shake any Japs down. Will you be taking all that Japanese liquor and wine with you? The sake? Oh, yes, of course, yes. And don't forget the screens around my bed. It's all the rage. And I'm yes, not... sir. <laughs> oh, the old screens. You know, Bradlock, I think we better leave all that nitroglycerine behind. Yes? You can't leave all that nitroglycerine behind, Seagoon. I wasn't going to. I was going to leave it behind Bloodlock. <laughs> <laughs> Naughty Neddy. No ad libbing now. Now listen, Nurk. And this, dear listeners, is where we sow the seeds of wisdom is. <clears throat> Neddy. And there uh, is. <laughs> now, Neddy. There's no question of you leaving no glycerin behind. If you want your back pay, all the war office. But it's so dangerous. Nitroglycerin? A lorry? Yes. <laughs> Dawn and the fourth armored thunderboxes prepare for the long journey home. Before departure, the surrender document is signed. Now, General Yakamoto will sign here. We'll uh, fill in the amount later. <laughs> I watched enthralled as slowly we hauled down the imperial Japanese credit note and ran up the victorious bouncing British check. <laughs> Sign with a cross, eh? <laughs> you illiterate swine, you. Pass me the ink pad. <laughs> there. There's my thumbprint. <laughs> now we both signed, mate. Now, get back in your tree. Right Hurry up, Seagull. We're ready to leave. Are the lorries warmed up? Yes, you had them in the oven all night. <laughs> How do you like yours? Medium rare. Splendid, splendid. Then you'd better drive the medium rare lorry carrying the nitro. I, uh, I, <laughs> I'd rather drive the lorry with the sake. No, but you're a teetotaler. No, I insist on driving with the sake. Why? Well, it's a long, long story here. I mean, I... Well, um... There's a little yellow idol to the north of... Yes, yes, I know. What? But I refuse to drive the nitro lorry. Why not? Well, it's a long story. You see? Well, there's a little yellow idol to the north of Captain Dool. Shut up, Seagoon. And here's a record of me saying it. Shut up, Seagoon. Shut up, Shut up, the famous echo. Shut up, the famous echo. Shut up. Shut up. Shut up. Shut up. Get off this record at once. Oh, oh hello. <laughs> Private Eccles, just the man. Do you see that lorry that everybody's keeping clear of? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Good, 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 good. Well, drive it back to London. Gently. Okay. Okay. Good boy. A good job I wasn't on it. <laughs> what? Then who 
was driving it. I was keeping in the back of that lorry like a happy boy traveler when plungy I was blown backwards out of my boots. Little black and hairless singed goon. What are you doing in that lorry? Well, it's a long story, Captain. You see, there's a little cardboard idol to the north of East Finchley, and the smoke was... Here's Ray Ellington. Oh, Matthew. <laughs> But I love you only I'd rather be lonely than happy with somebody else Yes The night time's the right time for hugging and kissing Night time is my time for just reminiscing Regretting instead of forgetting with somebody else I want no one unless that someone is you You, you to be independently blue, 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 blue. I want your love, but I don't want to borrow. Too happy today to give back tomorrow. But my love is your love, and no love for nobody else. demon plasterer, but then you'll have guessed. And now, the fear of wages part the scram. Five weeks of travel saw the lorries well on their way. Mm. Mm. Look, Dr. you must stop drinking that sake. Without mm. it, no back pay. Oh, come on, just this one. It's thirsty work, this drinking, you know. Mm. <laughs> A little do English for no. That it are not sake he are drinking, but nitroglycerine that I substitute. Hoi hi 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 in Japanese. Keep quiet, have that free air. Sorry, was just giving listeners story of plot. <laughs> Meanwhile, in England, at number 10 Frith Street. Rubo, 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 Custard, Rubo. Great pipe, you say the nitro exploded when they were in a lorry? Yes, Fred. Our little plan went for a button. That's why I've arranged this meeting. I see. Are you positive that this missing regiment has reappeared and is even now on its way back to England? Yes, Mr. Chancellor of the Exchequer. <laughs> and according to our records, their combined back pay and accrued interests amounts to 33 million pounds. Oh, dear, 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 dear. This will ruin my budget. <laughs> that regiment must be stopped before it reaches England. Yes, we'll declare war on them. What? England can't declare war on English troops. Why not? Everyone else does. No, 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 no. 
We must get a foreign power to do it. Well, choose one. Well, Japan isn't doing anything at the moment. <laughs> I'll inform Tokyo at once. Right. Hello, Tokyo. Yakapakaka ying from Italy, poo, needle, noodle, loo. Declare war on the fourth armored thunderboxes now in Burma. I do at once. Hello, commander of Imperial Japanese forces in that tree on back of lorry in Burma. Yes, sir. Declare war on fourth armored thunderboxes. I do. Very good. Fire. Bad luck. Stop the lorry. Those Japs are firing at us. Help me off with me, Jack. Oh, Major Peace! <laughs> Not Leo the Lion. Yes. Leo's are back again. They know the tattered leg trick now. Well, there you are. It's done the trick. <laughs> They've stopped firing. Yes! I've run out of ammunition. What? Well, there's no dice here. You've had enough on trick from us already. Wait a minute. Please tell me how much we owe. Shigun, play him back his account. Right, sir. And six will save me. <laughs> leave, believe, please. I promise I pay you back at the rate of a week. <laughs> Shigun, how much is in English money? It's about. So <laughs> it's not enough, you hear? Here, hold me trousers no! off. <laughs> oh, get him out of that tree. It's the this one. <laughs> They've found more ammunition. They must have had a Red Cross parcel from home. Quick! Quick! Into the driving cab. It's bulletproof. Splendid. We can drive on and continue engaging the enemy in that tree in the back of the lorry all at the same time. A magnificent exposition of the plot, Dundalk. Thank you. And under enemy fire, too. Of course. Have a knighthood. Oh, tar, mate. Right then. <laughs> drive on, Sir Dennis. Beep, beep. Oh. Yes. Oh. Oh. Don't antagonize him, Seagull. Get your head off, Well, thank you for your cabinet meeting, Rhubarbs. <laughs> now, gentlemen, our plan to stop the fourth armored thunderboxes has failed. Whoa. We shall probably have to give them all their back pay. What? 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 I said it first. <laughs> Custard. What? Didn't the Japanese declare World War Three on them? Yes, but Seagorn has managed to get the war onto the back of the lorry and is driving it here. Honors. Oh, honors. Yes. I must get in touch with them. What's the number of that lorry? Uh, GXK639. GXK639. Take the wheel, Bedlock. Hello? World War Three speaking. Where are you speaking from? We are just drawing up outside number 10, Thrift Street. That's us at the door now. Moriarty, answer it. So pristy measurements. <laughs> Seagull's the name. Seagull? Oh, you, you, it can't be. You're a lying charlatan. Rubbish. I'm a truthful charlatan. <laughs> now, where's our back pay? Back pay? Oh, you, you, stop shaving your head. <laughs> welcome, Colonel Seagull, welcome. Now, before you get your back pay, there is a little matter of handing over the enemy stores. <laughs> There's the lorry. The captured Japanese forces up the tree, but the nitroglycerine exploded. And the thousand cans of sake? Ooh. <laughs> uh, I'm afraid blood not drank it. Well, I'm sorry, Sigun. No sake, no back pain. What? Heckles, oh. get an empty bucket, quick. Now, grab Bloodlock's ankles. Yeah. What's oh. going on here? Hold his head over the bucket. Now, mm -hmm. shake him. Come on. Uh, Come uh, on. Uh, no sake, uh, no pain. Uh, 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 Listeners will recall that Bloodnock has not been drinking sake but nitroglycerin. Therefore. And so ended World War Three. Book now for World War Four. <laughs> Mr. Greenslands, would you mind telling the nice peoples that I have not been dead this way? Certainly. 
Ladies and gentlemen, it is both a privilege and a pleasure to announce... Shut up, Lubon. Shut up, Lubon. Shut up. A privilege and a pleasure to announce that the lad Blue Bottle was not deaded this week. Not deaded this week. Here, that was a good game, that was, wasn't it? I like it. That was The Goon Show, a BBC recorded programme featuring Peter Sellers, Harry Seacombe, Spike Milligan, with the Religion Quartet and Max Galbraith. The orchestra was conducted by Wally Stott, script by Spike Milligan and Larry Stevens, announcer Wallace Greenslade, the programme produced by Pat Dixon. Present Tony Hancock, Sidney James, and Bill Kerr in <sighs> Hancock's Half Hour. <laughs> well, I think it's disgusting. Are you moaning again? I have every reason to moan. I'm incensed. I am dead incensed. <laughs> I never remember being more incensed than I am now. <laughs> it's a great shame. What is? Haven't you heard about it? Old Fred's been given notice by the council. No. He has. He's been given two weeks to hitch up his horse and move his pie stall out of the market square. They can't do that. Exactly what I said. That pie stall's been there ever since I remember. It's on all those brown postcards they sell in the tobacconists. In fact, and this is not very well known, actually, I'll take you into my confidence here... If you get a magnifying glass out and study the group standing round the pie stall, do you know who you'll see? Who? My father. <laughs> He's the one in the bowler hat and the knotted scarf. <laughs> Holding a cup of tea and a plate of saveloys, if I remember rightly. <laughs> and next to him is his good lady wife, my mother. Wrapping her teeth round a fried egg sandwich. You take that pie stall away and you take yet another part of the English scene with it. Oh, talk sense. The council have given their reasons for giving him notice. What reasons? Well, they say it's unhygienic, for one. They say he should not wash his cups out in the horse trough. <laughs> He's been washing his cups out in the horse trough for years. Why have they only just noticed it? Anyway, what's wrong with it? It's running water. Yeah, well, maybe it is. But you cannot deny that the rag and bone man's horse died last year. <laughs> Well, what's that got to do with it? Well, the vet said in his post-mortem this animal died because it was clogged up with tea leaves. <laughs> oh, that's rubbish. If anything, that was what kept him going. <laughs> he was 39, to my knowledge. Well, I don't know. He carries a lot of sway down at the council meeting. Anyway, they're trying to modernise the square. They've had the plans passed by the town and country planning. But what do they want to modernise it for? That's half the charm of it. Because people are not shopping in the town anymore. They're going to the other modern places. And it's because this town has fallen behind the times. Oh, nonsense. It's true. Look at the old-fashioned stuff down our high street. People don't want to see butchers' shops with all the meat hanging up outside these days. They want it under glass, in refrigerators. What? I don't hold with all this wrapping stuff up and keeping it in refrigerators. Takes all the goodness out of it. I like to see him hack it off and whop it on the scales, mate. 
<laughs> yeah, well, it's more hygienic the other way. Rubbish. My grandfather lived to be 97 and he never saw a plastic bag in his life. <laughs> all this hygiene stuff may be very nice, but it takes all the charm out of things. I ask you. <laughs> what have you got when you buy a spud today? 27 different fertilizers done up in a jacket. <laughs> Now, yeah, come off it. Do they taste the same today as they used to? I'm asking you. All the romance has gone out of marketplaces. Maybe, but they're modernising, and you can't have a contemporary marketplace with a meat pie stall stuck in the middle of it. Well, I see no reason why not. Hey, Tub, guess what? What? Go on, have a guess. No, no, no. C come on, tell me, tell me. No, 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 no. Go on. You, you, you guess. No, no, I can't. Come on, come on. Tell me, tell me. Well, no, that'd spoil it. Have a guess. I don't know. <laughs> well, give me a clue. Ah, that'd be as good as telling you. Oh, go on, don't be rotten. Tell me. Come on, come on. I tell you everything I know, don't I? Well, just have a try. Go on, just one guess. How can I guess at something I haven't got the faintest idea about? <laughs> now, come on, tell me. You know I can't stand playing around when there's something I don't know about going around. Well, you promise you won't tell anybody? Yes, yes. Tell me. Oh, all right, then. The town council have told Fred to move his pie stall out of the marketplace. <laughs> oh, for crying out loud, I know that. I've been talking about it for the last half an hour. Did you hear all that, Sid? Yes, I heard it. And a bigger couple of twits I never met. <laughs> I resent that. I am not a twit. He started it. I did not. Yes, you did. Oh, for Pete's sake, you're like a couple of kids, you are. It's him. I'm not like that with other people. I don't talk to the squire like that. I'm very erudite. He doesn't know what I'm talking about half the time. <laughs> it's this fool here. <laughs> he brings out the worst in me. He's an idiot. You're a poltroon. I wish I hadn't told you now. <laughs> so do I. I wish I hadn't come at all. Well, I don't know why you did. I told you to stay out till tea time. Well, I was fed up out there. There was nothing to do. You had your ball, didn't you? Well, there was nobody to throw it to. You could have thrown it up in the air. No imagination, some people. I can't understand it. <laughs> well, it's a shame about the pie stall, isn't it? Yes, it is. I was just saying to Sid, they ought to leave things alone. All the things I knew as a boy are gradually going. Do you realise there's not one peas pudding and faggot shop left in Cheam? <laughs> They've all gone. That's true. I remember my mum sending me down on a Friday night with me bowl. With a bit of greaseproof paper over the top? Yeah, that's it. I used to get it full up. Three dollops of peace pudding, two faggots, a savaloy, and two pig's trotters. How much? Three a pudding, two fags, a sav, and a couple of pigs. Never more than tempers. And on a coronation day, two extra faggots and a spoon with a crest on it. <laughs> ah, so there's nothing like that these days. No. Old Fred's pie stall is the last remaining link with those halcyon days, and they want to get rid of him. Where are we going to go after the pictures on a Saturday night? You may well ask. Where indeed? I used to look forward to me half an hour, lean up against Fred's urn. Did the rheumatism in my shoulder much more good than three hours under the sun lamp that did? Perfect way to end an evening at the pictures, that was. Standing round the pie store with the other lads, dipping our meat pies in the chopped sauce on the edge of the plate, and discussing whether we fancied the bird in the second feature. Yeah, good old Fred. Yes, long may his sugar spoon dangle on the end of the chain. Well, there should be some way of keeping it. We'll just have to go into one of the coffee houses in the high street. Never. I hate those things. The El Corrida. The Tropicana. The El Granada. All those horrible plants creeping up the walls. <laughs> Bamboo canes. Plastic cactuses. All leaves and froth, those blazes. And the grub. <laughs> Nothing British in there at all. Shish kebab a la Constantinople. <laughs> Omelette Valenciana. In Cheam High Street, mark you. <laughs> Can't even get a roll and butter. It's croissant au beurre. <laughs> Pardon me for living, I'm sure. And the waitresses. Ponytails and their brother's sweaters, that's them. <laughs> Black stocking fools. Sitting there with their green fingernails and their omnibus edition of Ibsen. <laughs> Got no time for them. 
show me the piece of apple strudel that compares to one of Fred's stale cheesecakes. Yeah, I know what you mean. First time I went in one, there's bird behind the counter. You know the one with the... No, 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 not the skinny one with the leopard skin tights on. No, no, not her. The other one, Margot, isn't it? The one with the blue streaks in her hair. Oh, uh, yes. Oh, dear, oh, dear. She always reminds me of something Boris Karloff had a go at. <laughs> Pity, eh? Well, first time in, I didn't know the jargon, you see. So yeah. she comes up, she said, would you like a cappuccino? Yeah, yeah. I said, well, I don't fancy the chino, but I'll have a cup of tea. <laughs> Marvellous, isn't it? Marvellous, So yeah. she giggled and said to her, oh, dear. Our oh, plebeian. What's plebeian? Plebeian. It's from the Latin, plebes. Defined by Pliny as derivative from plebiscum. Yeah, but what does it mean? It means you're a scruff bag. <laughs> I quite agree with you, Sid. I'd never patronise one of those coffee places again. Here. How can you have a sandwich without a lump of bread stuck on top? That's what they tried to palm me off with. An open sandwich, they called it. <laughs> Bits of meat and carrots and stuff squeezed out of tube. <laughs> well, I kicked up a fuss. I don't blame you. I told her straight. I said, look, dear, I don't know where you come from. Well, I knew she wasn't English. She spoke it too well. <laughs> I said, I don't know where you come from, but we haven't had bread ration over here for years. <laughs> so come on, I said, whack another slice on top, I said. I wish she hadn't. Now it cost me another ninepence. <laughs> then, of course, I must admit, <laughs> I made a right Charlie of myself, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't know they had brown sugar. <laughs> I said, bring another bowl of sugar. Somebody spilt their coffee in this one. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's the sort of thing the council prefers. They want to get rid of Fred and open up more coffee shops. That's the trouble. No one's proud of being British these days. They all seem to think foreigners can do everything better. Well, they can't. I've been all over France and I've yet to see one pie store for all their chat about good food. Yeah. There's too many foreigners in the world. You can't go anywhere abroad without meeting them. <laughs> quite, quite, quite. And they're all coming over here for their holidays. That's what bothers me. Ah, yes, but that's a good thing. They bring money into the country. But only foreign money. What's the good of that? You can't spend it here. <laughs> you try and pay your gas bill with a handful of Yugoslavian piastres and see what they say. <laughs> of course, they're getting back. It's old Fred I feel sorry for. Being moved on at his time of life, where would he go? I heard he was going to sell up and go back to Italy. Italy? Yeah, well, that's where he comes from. Is he a foreigner, then? Only by birth. <laughs> Still, come to think of it, I'm not surprised. I always thought a red bandana and gold earrings wasn't the hallmark of a Surrey man. <laughs> yeah, well, I thought he was a bit eccentric, that's all. Still, he's practically British. He came over when he was three to take over the pie stall when his dad died. Oh, well, that's it, then. That's good enough for me. As far as I'm concerned, anyone who flogs meat pies is British. I don't care where he was born. For my money, he became naturalised the minute he unhitched his horse, opened the shutters and watered down his first bottle of chop sauce. Here, here. <laughs> the point is, does Fred want... How did he get the name Fred? He didn't think Giuseppe Antonio looked right over a pie store. <laughs> He's dead right, of course. It is a bit ice cream and wafers, isn't it, really? Anyway, the point is, does Fred want to go? Oh, no, he doesn't. He's very cut up about it. He's been there all his life. Well, that's it, then. His freedom is being encroached upon. He should have the right to trade where he likes. To speak his mind is every free man's right. In peace, battle, war, hostilities, uprisings, floods, tempests, force majeure, and motor car accidents. <laughs> Magna Carta, Runnymede, 1793... <laughs> Henry VIII versus the barons, barons talking. <laughs> As the inscription says on the Statue of Liberty, just under the fold of her skirt, it says, Liberté, égalité, et fraternité. What does it mean? <laughs> it means liberty, equality, and fraternity. What else could it mean, you great witless dandy? <laughs> no, it doesn't say that on the Statue of Liberty. Well, it says it somewhere. On the blade of the guillotine, that's it. The point being that we must stand by Fred in his hour of need. His fight against the maelstrom of vacuitous bureaucracy. I second that. 
Thank you. That's a great help. <laughs> what do we do first, then? I suggest we go and have a summit conference with Fred and see what he's got to say about it. Between us, we will rout the council as Adrian did the Persians on the walls of Jericho. <laughs> Didn't he? Well, I don't know. Well, it doesn't matter. Come on. Evening, Fred. Evening, Mr. H. What's it to be tonight? Uh, three pies, please, Fred, and uh, three mugs of steaming hot chicory essence. <laughs> with or without? With or without one? <laughs> Handles. Uh, <laughs> only, uh, you see, uh, some clients prefer them without handles, and then they can warm their hands around it. Come now, Fred, you should know by now I always have handles. Lots of ladies pass by, and it's very hard to cock the little finger when it's wrapped round a mug of coffee. <laughs> Mustard on the pies. Please, I want to lift the crust up and whop in a saveloy, will you? Come up. Uh, same for me, Only Put the mustard on the saveloy and cut off the curly bit at the end of the skin. <sighs> oh, the smell of this place. Drives me crackers. <laughs> Isn't it marvellous? Sensuous. If only I could find a lady who uses scent like this, I'd marry her like a shot. <laughs> Here you are. Three pies, two with serves, one in, one out. Three coffees, one with two and out. Thanks very much. Very nicely done, mate. Fred, I'm sorry to hear about the news. What, you mean me closing down? Yes, it's a crying shame. It's a bitter blow to we gourmets. Yeah, I'm pretty choked about it myself. <laughs> and we feel that... You got any salt there, Fred? Here's a knife. Scrape some off the block. <laughs> Thank you. We feel that something ought to be done about it. Well, I don't know what can be done. I lodged an appeal, but they turned it down. They said the store was out of keeping with the rest of the square and lowered the town of the district. Well, Fred, we are going to help you. Really? We're going to organise on your behalf. We'll start a movement, the Friends of the Pie Stall. I'll be treasurer. You won't. <laughs> now, how many people use your pie stall every day? Well, let me see. I start off each morning with 200 cups, and when I finish at night, I've got about 50 left. I should say about 150. That's, that's 150 regular satisfied customers. Yeah. And how many people on the council? Uh, including the mayor, 26. That's 150 against 26. Yeah, I reckon we ought to be able to duff them up all right. We are not going to duff anybody up. <laughs> this campaign must be carried out with no violence if it's to attract the sympathy of the public. Besides that, Alderman Harris swings that mace about something rotten. <laughs> Seen him knock three councillors down in one go when the meetings get a bit lively. <laughs> Let's think now, how much grace have they given you, Fred? Two weeks. Then if I haven't moved, they're going to send the police to tow me away. I know what we can do. Ah. Ah. The strategist is about to speak. <laughs> we must hold him off, keep him at bay. Brilliant. How do we keep the whole of the East Team Constabulary at bay? Easy. We go round and collect every available pie stall in Surrey. Yes. Then we bring them all into the market square. Yes. Well, then when the police come, we put the pie stalls in a big circle and hold them off. Like they do in wagon train. <laughs> Hiding behind the wheels, throwing meat pies at them. <laughs> yeah. I see. And they're all galloping round on their horses, chucking lighted truncheons at it. <laughs> yeah. Over the top of the pie stalls. Yeah. I hope one it's you. <laughs> All the pie stalls in Surrey in a circle. What a daft idea. It'd be had up for obstruction. What about appealing direct to the Prime Minister? I don't think we'll get much change out of him. I don't see him as a pie stall man somehow. His elbow in a puddle of cold tea, opening the budget box to get one and nine out. <laughs> no, I don't think so. He's more of a salt beef sandwich man, I should think. That's all I can think of. Short of punching him up, you didn't go much on that. Of course, the trouble of those council blokes is, they don't know nothing about meat pie stalls. They've never been here. Not one of them. Well, that's it, then. We must introduce them to the delights of meat pie eating. We must show them what they're missing. We'll invite them down to the stall here and put on a bit of a show for them. What sort of a show? Well, we'll get the place done up a bit. 
to be their coat of paint and the coloured lights strung up from the top of Queen Victoria's crown, hooked round your stovepipe, then across the horse trough. The reflections will look lovely on the water. Oh, very Venetian that'll be. Then tie him round the gargoyle so the two jets of water coming out of his ears will be lit up. Sort of fountains of Rome effect. Then we'll get young Elvis Dalrymple from the coffee house on the guitar. Give him a couple of bob to forget Skiffle for the night. Play the old Neapolitan songs, you know, the Harry Seacombe stuff. A few pots of flowers up on the roof. Cool, that sounds marvellous. We'll get a few tables and chairs out in the roadway, put some goldfish in the horse trough. It'll look like <laughs> not as dark by the time we finish with it. I tell you what, us three will be waiters for the night. I can't pay you. That's all right, just give us a free hot dog every night for a year. Done. Right, I'll get the invitations sent out tomorrow. I think this calls for a celebration. Fred, three bacon sandwiches, please. Gentlemen, raise your mugs. I give you Fred's pie stall. Long may the wedges stay under its cartwheels. Excuse me, Mr. Mayor, this invitation's just arrived in the post. Oh, show me. You're cordially invited to a gala night at Fred's pie stall under the statue in the market square. Parking space available on the left-hand side of the road on even dates. Open-air cafeteria, ornamental horse trough. Dine under the stars with the stars. Music by Elvis Dalrymple and his Moonlight Serenaders. Excitingly new Cockney menu, licensed to sell fags. If wet, room for twelve under the shutter. RSVP, if you fancy it. Most intriguing. Uh, uh, take a letter, Miss Burke. Dear, uh, dear Mr. Fred, I have great pleasure. Excuse me, Vicar. Yes, what is it, Tomkins? This invitation has just arrived, sir. Oh, thank you, Tomkins. Your utmost reverence, sir, your presence is requested at a simple frugal pie nosh up in the market square. <laughs> We hope several esteemed members of your flock will also be in attendance. The meeting, though secular in conception, will be ecclesiastical in decorum, so we have no fears about bringing along their good soul your charming lady spouse, the Mrs. Reverend. <laughs> All proceeds to the church roof fund. Dress informal, gaiters optional. <laughs> your servant, A. Hancock, campanologist to the trade. Will you be going, sir? Well, of course, Tomkins. I never miss an opportunity to meet my parishioners socially. You may lay out my new shoes with the Canterbury buckle. Good morning, my lad. Morning, with us. This invitation was delivered this morning. Oh, thank you, with us. <clears throat> Who the devil's this from? My dear Lord Cheam, the villagers of whom I am their humble spokesman, would be grateful if you and her ladyship would consent to come down amongst us on the occasion of the simple village festivities in the market square. We cannot, of course, hope to compete with the glittering hunt balls that you gents throw, but we think you may find some amusement in watching the simple villagers in their natural surroundings. We apologise for the delay, due to the bad harvest, in sending you the annual hogshead of cider, field of corn and twenty sucking pigs. There'll be plenty of room for you to park your bubble car in the high street. <laughs> I am your humble, obedient village servant, Anthony Hancock, serf. Yes, shall I... <laughs> shall I tear it up, sir? Certainly not, if there's some free fodder going. Caroline, come down here. We've been invited out for fodder. Three meat pies and a cheesecake for Councillor Brickman's party at table four. Three pies and a cheese coming up. Another cup of varnish for the vicar next to the horse shop, please. One split potato with butter in and no pepper. Two chip sandwiches for the mayor and dig the eyes out. Three cups of grey coffee, two without handles, one with. Three saveloys and a rock cake for his lordship with mustard. Not on the rock cakes. <laughs> I'm so sorry, your lordship. Two roll mops, play the works for the general. A packet of cheap fags with filters for Lady Chief. Excuse me, vicar, do you mind not throwing your pie crust into the horse trough? They, they do coagulate, so thank you very much. <laughs> Fried egg sandwich and a jam lardy for the commissioner of police. How are you, Fred? Alderman Barnes, two bread and dripping and a ginger beer. Oh, and just off a couple of cream slices for the health inspector. What do you think, Mr. H? 
How do you think it's going? Like a bomb. They like your stuff, Fed. There's no doubt about that. They're getting it down them. I've never seen so much dripping disappear in one evening. I've never had a clientele like this before. All the knobs in tea must be sitting around here. Yes, it makes a nice change to see a handful of rings around a Savaloy. Well, I think I'd better go around and mingle with the guests. Start the chat going about the council closing the stall down, you know. I think this is the right time. Strike while the pie's hot, I always say. Good evening, Vicar. Oh, good evening, Mr. Hancock. Are you enjoying the peas pudding? Oh, it's delightful. I had no idea such delicacies as we've seen tonight existed. May I have another faggot? Certainly. Fag, another fag for the Vic. You won't get this sort of thing in these coffee houses across the street, you know? No, I suppose not. It's exclusive to this establishment. Nowhere else like it in Cheam. If this place goes, you'll never get the like of this again. Yes, but surely there's no question of it going. I'm told the stall stood here for 60 years. True, but the council have given Fred notice to pull up his shafts and leave. I know you're a great lad for tradition. It's a great pity. Dear me, we can't have that. I shall have to speak to the mayor about it. I do have some influence in the council, yes. I should have a word with him. Good lad, have a chit. That entitles you to a faggot and a cup of tea at the counter. Excuse me, I must pass on to excuse me. Ah, oh, Mr. Mayor, is the fried egg sandwich to your liking? Very much, very nice indeed. I didn't know he served food like this. Ah, oh, well, that's because you've got on a bit. You've cut yourself off from the proletariat. Threatening to close it down, dangerous thing for a mayor to do. Especially with the council elections coming up shortly, if you get my meaning. Oh, I hadn't thought of it like that. Mm, well, you ought to, Mush. <laughs> Still, no hard feelings, is a chip. Good help. Ah, oh, your lordship, enjoying yourself? Capital, capital. Cheap, isn't it? Wish I'd known about this place before. I'll be coming down here more often. Perhaps not. The council want to close it down, you know. Oh, we'll soon see about that. By the way, old chap, does he serve stuff to take away? Well, generally, you have to bring your own basin, but I'm sure Fred will lend you one of his. Good show. Now I think I'll have a word with that mayor. Closing it down, indeed. I say, mayor, come here. I want to have a word with you. <laughs> Seen Fred lately, Tub? No, I haven't. He's done well since we saved his pie stall, hasn't he? Done well. Have you seen that new house he's had built? Ten thousand pounds if it was a penny. And ostentatious. Fancy having a roof shaped like a pie crust. <laughs> of course, it's fashionable now. The word's got round Mayfair. It's all the rage since the do. Have you tried to get near his stall lately? You can't see the counter for bowler hats and Bentleys. I know, doesn't it make you sick? And of course the prices have shot up. Champagne and Savaloys, three guineas a head. <laughs> you won't look at me anymore. Me. If it wasn't for me, he wouldn't have a stall left. All those guards officers. Every night, faggot fights down the high street. <laughs> Disgusting. And the horses can't get near the trough. Got it full up with ice for the champagne. It's not good enough. I can't afford to eat there anymore at those prices. Ten and six for a meat pie, it's ridiculous. Oh, well, we can't eat there anymore. Where shall we go? I'm hungry. Let's go down to the El Granada. I quite like it these days. The coffee's not too bad once you've blown the froth off, and the, those frankfurters, are, they're just like Savaloy's. I mean, a bit skinnier, but none the worse for that. Yeah, and that ravioli stuff's just like a plate of little meat pies, isn't it? Well, of course it is. Yes, there's a lot to be said for coffee houses. Those girls aren't at all bad when you get close to them. I quite like green fingernails. Rather sensuous, I feel. <laughs> yeah, it's what you get used to, isn't it? Quite, quite. It's all a matter of taste. Yeah, well, personally, I couldn't care less if I never see another sample as long as I live. Neither do I. I've never cared to think what Fred put in them, have you? Well, now these things are clean, down at the coffee house. Yes, there's a lot to be said for hygiene. Emptying his grouts into a horse trough, it wasn't very nice, was it? Disgusting. I think we're better off out of it. Me too. So do I. Much more pleasant surroundings in the coffee house. Definitely. Oh, very dirty place, Fred's place. Well, I've always said that. I mean, it should have been closed down ages ago. I don't know. That was Hancock's Half Hour with Tony Hancock, Sidney James, Bill Kerr, Wilfred Babbage, Hugh Morton and Harry Tyrell. The incidental music was composed and conducted by Wally Stott. 
Ray Golton and Alan Simpson wrote the script and the production, which was recorded, was by Tom Ronald. Radio England UK 2. Then, that's a bit near the knuckle. <laughs> Never mind, Mr. Ah. Peter. Never mind. Comfort yourself with the leading part in this daring sex drama oh. entitled <laughs> The Telephone. Simple. Act one, scene one. The North London GPO telephone manager's office. <laughs> What's that, Jim? Uh, telephone come. Oh. So they've installed one at last, Jim. Call a meeting of all the people we keep specially for meetings. <laughs> all right. And make it three o'clock. Right. I'll put the hands over the... <laughs> of the robot society. <laughs> Gentlemen, this first meeting of the telephone managers will be presided over in his new underpants by Mr. Jasper Bass at 614. Thank you, thank you. Sit down. First, first I'll read this telegram here, what I've got. It says, good luck, and it's signed Dr. Hill. <laughs> One of our lads who's done very well since he gave up doing his turn in the wireless. <laughs> well, hmm? thank you. Right. Now then, who's next, Jim? Me and I'm birthday. Oh. <laughs> I'm the area manager for Uxbridge, so there. <laughs> Shut up! I'm in enough trouble as it is. There's somebody in my district who wants a phone. Good heaven! Uh, alarm, alarm! Yes! Yeah. Uh, Terrible! Super alarm, 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 rhubarb! King Kong hit a white phone in front of all. And what's more, he wants a coloured one. What colour telephone did this fellow want? Black, it's thickening. <laughs> Have you got the name of this sensual, pleasure-loving devil? <laughs> Henry Albert Sebastable, Queen Victoria Crown. Disgusting! I've held him off for eight years, but my supplies of our printed refusal cards was running so low. The things they use them for, I tell you, I've never... Uh, really may I inter <laughs> May I interrupt here, gentlemen? Yes, you have! You have interrupted! I happen to know that Mr. Crumb is the inventor of the black telephone. Oh, black? Rubbish! Argy bargy. <laughs> what about Edison Bell? Edison Bell, sir, invented the brown telephone. Gentlemen, <laughs> if we know what's good for us, we'll give this chap crown a telephone immediately. Hello, listeners. The job of installing Crumb's phone fell to me, Ned Seagoon. Thank you. <laughs> As you've guessed for that tune, I was the senior outdoor line layer, Oxbridge area. That is quite true. Seagoon had just finished a brilliant military career by climbing over the wall at Aldershot. <laughs> <laughs> he arrived at Mr. Crun's house. Oh, good morning, Pesman. Uh, three pints, please. No, 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 you don't understand. I've come to install a black telephone. Four pints and a small brown. I'm sorry, I've only got a large black. Oh, a large black? It's a pretty bump it. What type of talking are you doing there? I'm from the GPO. We have nothing to hide. And we have nothing to show either. But do come in, Gopo. You'll, um... <laughs> You'll pardon the mess. We can't help it, really. We're bachelors, you know. That's see. Why don't you get married? I would, but Moriarty doesn't love me. <laughs> um, um, are you Mr. Crun? No, I'm uh, Gritpipe Fine, a criminal by appointment to the Royal Household Cavalry. Oh, really? Why are you living in a hole in the ground? Something to do with the shortage of money. You know. uh, Mr. Crun's moved there? Yes, to 17A Africa. <laughs> 
70 lay Africa. Hmm. Can I get that down the Finchley Road? Eventually, yeah. <laughs> I better write that down. E V E M C H E W C H A L Y. Eventually. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Right. Goodbye. No, look at it. Come back to little boiling bubble. <laughs> Listen to me. Before you go to 17 A Africa, yes. would you take this suspicious looking brown paper parcel, wrapped in string and tied with newspaper? Certainly. Certainly. Okay, William. 17 A Africa and step on it! 8 months later. <laughs> Mate, I'm, I'm nearly shagged out here, I am. You, you sure we're still in the Finchley Road? <sighs> of course. Now, let's see. We've, we've used 48,000 miles of cable. William, you better nip back to action for another telegraph phone. Oh, mate, I'm fed up going back like Port Conjoni from Brotingal, you know. <laughs> It's dark when I get home at night, and as soon as I get back, I have to turn round and cycle like the clappers to get back here in the morning. Yes, yes, I see. It does seem a long way out here. Perhaps we should ask our way. Pardon me. Sorry, boy, I'm a stranger around here. Would you call Max Gildre go? As Nettie is scattered blindly through Africa, at the extreme end of the Finchley Road, he little knew he was within a telephone call stir of the British telephone supply depot. You don't got Well, I can't sit here all day. <laughs> Stop, 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 stop. The palladium type comic type gentleman has just collapsed in a heap outside. I know, I tripped over that heap myself only this morning. Now lift up his wig and let Balfarnell have a look at him. Oh. Steady lad, a dull medical attention. Hand him with a thermometer and put a copy of the Lancet under his head. Goodness gracious, European type seriousness. He is, he is seriously unconscious, Major. No wonder. I'll just lift that heavy wallet off him. No wonder there were 40 pounds pressing on his chest. Now we'll restore the circulation in his arms with the toad on. No. Just put this pen in his hand and run it lightly over this check. There. Oh. Oh. Where am I? In the red. Thank heavens. A British bank manager. He, he's delirious. Hold him down while I force this brandy between my lips. <laughs> now, yes, you. You look much better now, lad. So are you. Now, if you'll pardon me, I'll just stand in this hole facing north. Why? It's all the rage, you know. Dad, it must be hell in there. Further down it is. Now, lad, what brings you to the steaming hell of Africa from the steaming hell of Finchley? I'm looking for the inventor of the black telephone. Ah, that's Crun, Henry Crun. So you're looking for that cool, high-stepping fool, are you? Him and his sensual Caucasian knee dancing. <laughs> That's how he tempted poor Minnie away from me. Oh, Min. <laughs> Come now, Major Dennis, please. What? No. Draw your tears of this marble statue of a handkerchief. Thank you. Poor Min. Abducted in the prime of her twilight. Oh, it's, it's a long story. I, I remember it all started on the road to Mandalay. Oh, Where the blind did you be? And... No. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes, 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 but, but that's your pigeon. So it is. How did it get out? 
that bell. Take this pigeon away and bring me a clothes brush. <laughs> You've been spotted, Major. <laughs> Simple question. Where is 17A Africa? 17A? You're on the wrong side of the continent. Oh. Odd numbers are right over on the other side. <laughs> well, could you let me have two white hunters and a safari to escort me? For a consideration. Thank you. You'll find them encamped in a hole in the ground at Korwatagonga. Right. <laughs> right. Goodbye, Major. Remember, tonight is Henry Hall guest night. <laughs> Splendid. I'll wear evening dress and earplugs. Oh. <laughs> Sitting over an all-night campfire, awaiting the arrival of Sigun, sit two all-night sun-tanned veterans of the safari. Thanks a pity bicycle. Oh, good. I'll slip on my pajamas. Why? Are they greasy? Oh. <laughs> Yay! Yeah. Can I tell you another one, Nickel? Yeah, I'd like that nice time. Oh. Oh. Yes, I, I like telling stories. Cause telling stories is fine. That's my echo. Yeah, bottle? This story is only for big boys. Oh, I'll put my hat on then. <laughs> okay. Yes. You won't tell my mum, will you, echo? No, no, no. That's a just a toy me on you. Yeah. Okay, now then. Now, go on, bottle. Go on. <laughs> Come on. Why did the chicken cross the right? Oh, ho, 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 ho. oh you naughty boy. <laughs> oh, you naughty boy. Oh, it's a good job for you. I'm a man of the world. Eh? That was not the end. <laughs> it finishes up to get to the other side. Oh, well, wait a no, 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 no. That, that's not as funny as the first one. <laughs> oh, dear, oh, dear. That was, that, that was funny, Bato. Why not funny, funny? <laughs> Why did the chicken go to... <laughs> You cannot appreciate my modern style back of much pop start joking. <laughs> you see, one of these days I shall be another no coward. We can't afford another no coward. I do not wish to discuss further. Oh. I have got other matters to think of. Oh, but I'll study now. Hey! There's something in my bed. The phantom struck a line. <laughs> it's a crocodile. Oh, a crocodile. That's lucky. A crocodile lucky? Of course he's lucky. He's got a bird to sleep in. I just switch up the candle. Oh, didn't I take 
Good night, Bottom. to take me to 17A Africa. Yes, we have got all your scars ready for the journey. Set to work. One naked human bath chair, one long time record of a naked woman. With clothes on, of course. No, clothes on the other side. Oh, I must the record over. Aye. Then I trust you don't even play that record in the dark. Mr. Ellington, a demonstration on your quam. Oh, he's going to quam. What's a quam? What? With the sun directly overhead and the ground directly on the foot, <laughs> telephone engineer Sigon pushed forward to install the black telephone before the rains came and the Joneses went. <laughs> now, you Tonga. We'll need a telegraph pole here. Good luck. Hand me those two bananas from my binocular case. Yeah, thank you. I think that's funny. I can see a French sign. Caution, Le Sahara Desert ahead. Le warning, no telephone engineer. I say, we can't stand for that. Put up a British sign immediately. There. No hawkers, no circulars. I say, can't you read? No hawkers, no circulars. Me, you're not a hawker. Then you must be a circular. <laughs> Isn't that? If you're not a hawker, you'll be a circular. You must be a... <laughs> English joke. African silence. <laughs> Let me tell you, back in England, I'm on the TV every week. I know. That's why I come to Africa. <laughs> Listen, little corny, steaming white comic. <laughs> Mr. Kwan sent me to find out if you've got a parcel from Moriarty for Blamey. Oh, yes. I'd forgotten all about that. So had the listeners. <laughs> and that is why I mention it. <laughs> yeah, good. Now, listen, Chief Elling, huh? You show me where Buana Kran lives, and me give you... Six white man telephone calls free. Right. You follow me. Meantime, in a little love nest at 17A Africa. Stop playing that saxophone in Africa and put it back in the fridge. 
You know they go up in this weather. You see, there goes one now. Now, Min, tonight you must wear your tiara and long raffia drawers. Henry. It's Henry Hall's death night, me. And I shall entertain you with my sensual Caucasian knee dancing. Wow. Oh. Well, up with your Caucasian knee dance. Rolling your trousers up and clacking those knobbly knees together. <laughs> You mean my knees are losing their magic? Yes. I want to go back to Dennis Bloodbox, the bounder of rope is like war. Don't you be a mixed up creature. Mm. Stop that simple Marilyn Monroe wobbling you. Ah, uh, the miller taught me something in a hurry. Hurry, <laughs> <laughs> Henry. The first careless rapture is over, darling. Someday I'll find you. Jenny Wheeler and Liberace. I'd like to remind listeners that approaching this scene is Chief Ellinger, followed on foot by Eccles, Blue Bottle, and the headlinesman from Finchley Telephone Exchange. These little snippets of information do help, don't they? Well, I, I won't hold up your fun any longer. If anybody wants me, I shall be in the residence lounge. <laughs> Seventeen A Africa, the end of the Finchley Road. Right. Eggles, break the door down by inserting the key in the lock. <laughs> All right, you high stepping cool fool, you. Now, where's that fair mini banister? I haven't got the fair. <laughs> then, you shall have to walk. Ta-da! Mini, I'm taking you away from the squalor that you live in oh. to the squalor that I live in. Ta-da! Well, that's one character left for Sellers to play. <laughs> Jack, have you got the parcel from Moriarty? Yes, I have, Henry. But first, where would you like your telephone? In my study, please. Where's that? Inside my house in North Finchley. <laughs> I say, that was a bit of bad luck for Mr. Siegel, wasn't it? And now, of course, I know you're all wondering what was in that brown paper parcel. Well, good night. Radio England, UK 2. Enter a short idiot. <laughs> good evening, folks. I commence by walking backwards for Christmas. Why? It's all the rage. <laughs> Next, an excerpt from East Lynn. Dead! Dead! And never called me mother! Perhaps you were a father. With the seagull. Please remove that false bald woman's wig. And leave myself naked at the mating season? <laughs> never! Very well. I sentence you to the highly esteemed goon show. They can go home today. Presenting Wallace Greenstreet in his daring announcement entitled Le Salaire de la Peur. Meaning the wages of fear all in England. The fear of wages.
missing regiments. Burma, 6th of March, 1956. These Japs can't hold out much longer. Oh, I don't know. This is the 14th year we've been fighting them. Don't worry, Major. I can't stand much more of your drunken singing and bottle throwing. Uh... I'm only doing my duty, sir. And they'd better surrender soon. We've had no food or pay since that silly telegram. Telegram? You know, give it here. Oh. Um, British forces Burma. Japan has surrendered. End of World War Two. Book now for World War Three. <laughs> Dated August 1945. Yes, yes. I, well, I, I've never shown it to you before because it was obviously the work of a practical joker. Well, I can... <laughs> I can only hope it is. Oh, stop, stop, stop. The Japanese officer is attacking us with the white flag, Ure. Dead! <laughs> and it's a new Mark III armor-piercing type white flag. Oh, blimey, I'm off. <laughs> look, 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 look. Don't panic. I'll show that Jabba thing or two. Help me off with me jumpers now. No, Come Major, on. please. Out of my way. <laughs> Look at that. Dear listeners, from the waist downwards, Bloodnock was tattooed with a pair of false legs. <laughs> Facing the wrong way. <laughs> yes, they're all the rage, you know. Please, do not shoot. Who are you? You remember me, Dennis Bloodnock? I will not you. <laughs> Come forward, military Japanese gentlemen. But keep your right leg raised. Please. I am General Yakamoto, commander of all Imperial Japanese troops in that tree. Well, I'm <laughs> Request me. Have unexpectedly run short of ammunition. Please, can we borrow two boxes until the end of the war? You haven't returned our loan, now, yet. <laughs> I'm very sorry, but have not finished mowing jungle. No. No more credit. Clear off. No, then I'm forced to surrender. Surrender? This means war. Ma? <laughs> I'm sorry, have no alternative. To whom do we surrender, honorable Japanese military stars, please? Stars? <laughs> You've got stars? Yes, I've got stars. One thousand cans of nitroglycerine. Oh. And two thousand cans of sake. <gasps> sake being potent Japanese rice wine. <laughs> sake being potent Japanese rice wine? Yes, sir. Oh. <laughs> I am forced, forced to accept your two thousand cans of sake surrender. Stack it under my bed, will you? Please. Uh, which are your tent, please? The white one with the red cross on it and the... Uh... <laughs> Three dummy nurses outside. Well, go on. Don't say you don't trust me. I don't trust you. I told you not to say it. <laughs> Hand me my Royal Engineer's saxophone issue type. <laughs> Quick, mud. Gad, what a day this has been. A triumph for British arms. Now, I must inform the war office that after 14 years of fighting, the Japanese army in that tree has finally surrendered. Telephone. Send those triumphant electric type impulses athwart the sleeping continents to the automatic type exchanges in London. At least. <laughs> Even now sounds the tinted appellation of the phone bell that will arouse the helmsman of England to whom I carry the victorious news. Back to see dogs, I mate. <laughs> yes! Wrong number. I shall hurry through to the field of wages. Part do you mind? Do, do mind. you mind? I'll make this announcement. Thank you, Walt. The field of wages, part two. The same day, four hours later. Money, 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 little money, 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 money. Oh, yo, 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 yo. Lovely money. It's all the rage. <laughs> Moriarty, shh. Pull that transparent blind down, you fool. Now, have you sewn that ten thousand pounds into the lining of your socks? Yes. 
<laughs> then help me get this hundred pounds in fivers under my wig. Right. Oh. <clears throat> Down in your right hand. Uh, back a bit. Uh, right. Uh, my this finger. Uh, there. Good man. Any more left? Only this fifty thousand pounds in loose silver. Oh. Now where can I hide that? Uh, I've got it. Moriarty, say ah. Uh, now, Moriarty, keep your mouth shut. I don't want... Army Pay Corps here, Chief Cashier speaking. Yes? What? Moriarty! <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. Yes, I'm... Never, never, never mind about that. Money, Auntie, we're, we're in the grid cart now. Remember the third armored thunderboxes who vanished in Burma ten years ago? Yes, 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 yes. Well, they're still alive. Oh! And that was their commander, Seagoon. Oh, I, oh, type O! But they spent all their back pay. Yes. 40,000 pounds, sophisticated court martial, cashiered, shot it down. Take aim, fire, bang. <laughs> now, don't panic, don't panic. <laughs> My malodorous Gallic Charlie will have to think of something else. Meanwhile, Max Gelray and his chromatic plinth. Oh, the horror is the brown in the jungle encampment of the 4th Armoured Thunderboxes. Dear sirs, I am a keen art student over the age of 21. Please forward me your selection of continental art studies in the plain wrapper. Care of ZM, Stokes, Right, no! Don't come in a minute, don't come in. Abdul, quick, put the screens on my bed. <clears throat> oh, uh, come in, Tegan. Thank you. Major, I was just walking backwards for Christmas and I thought... Oh. <clears throat> I, 
I beg your pardon, madam. I get behind that screen, Gladys. <laughs> Judy, Judy. My wife, you know, yes. It's all lies. We're just good friends, of course. Oh. Major. What, what? Grave type news. I've spoken to Whitehall, hmm? and the pay court denied that we're alive. What? I've never had a day's death in my life. <laughs> and what about our ten years back pay? Did you tell them we've been fighting all this time? I did. But they said these Japs we are fighting must be forgeries. You mean they're worthless? They said no bank would cash them. Well, there's only one way to get our back pay. We must return to England with the entire Japanese army in that tree there. Good, yes. Sergeant Goldberg? Yes, sir. What is it, sir? Uh, I'll prove that tree. I'll replant it in the back of a lorry. And try not to shake any Japs down. We'll just be taking all that Japanese liquor and wine with you. The sake? Oh, yes, of course, yes. And don't forget the screens around my bed. It's all the rage. And I yes, that. <laughs> the old screen. You know, Bradlock, I think we better leave all that nitroglycerine behind. Yes? You can't leave all that nitroglycerine behind, Seagorn. I wasn't going to. I was going to leave it behind Bradlock. <laughs> <laughs> Naughty Neddy. No ad-libbing now. Now listen, Nurk. And this, dear listeners, is where we sow the seeds of Neddy's demise. <clears throat> Neddy, stand at ease. Now, Neddy, there's no question of you leaving that naughty, unexploded nitroglycerin behind. If you want your back pay, all Japanese stores must be surrendered to the war office. But it's so dangerous. Nitroglycerin? A lorry? Yes. <laughs> And the fourth armored thunderboxes prepare for the long journey home. Before departure, the surrender document is signed. Now, uh, General Yakamoto will sign here. We'll uh, fill in the amount later. <laughs> I watched enthralled as slowly we hauled down the Imperial Japanese credit note and ran up the victorious, bouncing British check. <laughs> ah! Sign with a cross, eh? <laughs> you illiterate swine, you. Pass me the ink pad. <laughs> there. There's my thumbprint. <laughs> now we've both signed, mate. Now get back in your tree. Right Hurry up, Seagun. We're ready to leave. Are the lollies warmed up? Yes, you had them in the oven all night. <laughs> How do you like yours? Medium rare. Splendid, splendid. Then you better drive the medium rare lorry carrying the nitro. Ooh. I, uh... I... <laughs> I'd rather drive the lolly with the sake. No, but you're a teetotaler. No, I insist on driving with the sake. Why? Well, it's a long, long story here. I mean, I... Well, um... Uh, there's a little yellow idol to the north of... Yes, yes, I know. What? But I refuse to drive the nitro lorry. Why not? Well, it's a long story. You see? Well, there's a little yellow idol to the north of Captain Dole. Shut up, Seagoon. And here's a record of me saying it. Shut up, Seagull! Don't talk! Shut up, the famous echo! Shut up, the famous echo! Shut up! Don't talk! Get off this record at once! Oh, hello! <laughs> Private Echoes! Just the man! Do you see that lorry that everybody's keeping clear of? Oh, yeah. Yo, 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 yo. Good, 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 Well, drive it back to London. Gently. <laughs> okay. Okay. Good boy. A good job I wasn't on it. <laughs> Like a happy boy traveler, when plungy, I was blown backwards out of my boots. Little blackened, hairless, singed goon. <laughs> what are you doing in that lorry? 
Belly, it's a long story, Captain. You see, there's a little cardboard idol <laughs> to the north of East Finchley, and the smug was... Here's Ray Ellington. Oh, Matthew. <laughs> But I love you only I'd rather be lonely than happy with somebody else Yes The night time's the right time for hugging and kissing Night time is my time for just reminiscing Regretting instead of forgetting with somebody else I want no one unless that someone is you You, you to be independently blue, 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 blue. I want your love, but I don't want to borrow. To have it today, to give back tomorrow. But my love is your love, or no love for nobody demon plasterer, but then you'll have guessed. And now, the fear of wages part the scram. Five weeks of travel saw the lorries well on their way. Mm. Good luck. Roderick, you must stop drinking that sake. Without mm. it, no back pay. Oh, come on, just this one. It's thirsty work, this drinking, you know. Mm. A little do English for no. That it are not sake he are drinking, but nitroglycerine that I substitute. Hoi hi hi ha hoi in Japanese. Keep quiet, have that free air. Sorry, was just giving listeners story of plot. <laughs> Meanwhile, in England, at number 10 Frith Street. Rubar, 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 custard, rubar. Great pipe, you say the nitro exploded when they were in a lorry? Yes, Fred. Our little plan went for a button. That's why I've arranged this meeting. I see. Are you positive that this missing regiment has reappeared and is even now on its way back to England? Yes, Mr. Chancellor of the Exchequer. <laughs> and according to our records, their combined back pay and accrued interests amounts to 33 million pounds. Oh, dear, 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 dear. This will ruin my budget. <laughs> that regiment must be stopped. Before it reaches England. Yes, we'll declare war on them. What? England can't declare war on English troops. Why not? Everyone else does. <laughs> no, 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 no. We must get a foreign power to do it. Well, choose one. Well, Japan isn't doing anything at the moment. <laughs> I'll inform Tokyo at once. Right. Hello, Tokyo. Yakapakaka ying from Italy, poo, needle, not loo. Declare war on the fourth armored thunderboxes now in Burma. I do it once. Hello, commander of Imperial Japanese forces in that tree on back of lorry in Burma. Yes, sir. Declare war on force armored thunderboxes. I do. Tell it, God. Fire! 
Right, look. Stop the lorry. Those Japs are firing at us. Help me off with me, Jack. Oh, Major, please. <laughs> Not Leo the Lion. Please, yes. I'm back again. They do the tattered leg trick now. Well, there you are. It's done the trick. <laughs> They've stopped firing. Nuts! I've run out of ammunition. What? Well, there's no dice here. You've had enough on trick for a month already. Wait a minute. Please tell me how much we owe. Shigun, play him back his account. Right, sir. And sixpence ate me. <laughs> please, please, please. I promise I pay you back at the rate of... A week. <laughs> Shigun, how much is... In English money? It's about... <laughs> Sir, <laughs> it's not enough you hear. Here, hold me trousers. No! I'll... Uh, get them out of that tree. <laughs> with the this one... They've found more ammunition. They must have had a Red Cross parcel from home. Quick! Quick! Into the driving cab! It's bulletproof! Splendid. We can drive on and continue engaging the enemy in that tree in the back of the lorry all at the same time. A magnificent exposition of the plot, Dundalk. Thank you. And under enemy fire, too. Of course. Have a knighthood. Oh, tar, mate. Right then. <laughs> drive on, Sir Dennis. Beep a beep! Oh. Yes. Oh. Oh. Don't antagonize him, Seagull. Get your head off, Dundalk. Well, thank you for your cabinet meeting, Rhubarbs. <laughs> now, gentlemen, our plan to stop the fourth arm at Thunderboxes has failed. Whoa. We shall probably have to give them all their back pay. What? 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 I said it first. <laughs> Custard. What? Didn't the Japanese declare World War Three on them? Yes, but Seagorn has managed to get the war onto the back of the lorry and is driving it here. Honors. Oh, honors. I must get in touch with them. What's the number of that lorry? Uh, GXK639. GXK639. Take the wheel, Bedlock. Hello? World War Three speaking. Where are you speaking from? We are just drawing up outside number 10, Frith Street. That's us at the door now. Moriarty answering. So pristine measurements. <laughs> Seagull's the name. Seagull? Oh, you, you, it can't be. You're a lying charlatan. Rubbish. I'm a truthful charlatan. <laughs> now, where's our back pay? Back pay? Oh, you, oh, you, oh, you. So pristine and there's a glass house. Oh, you. Well, Auntie, stop shaving your head. <laughs> welcome, Colonel Seagull, welcome. Now, before you get your back pay, there is a little matter of handing over the enemy stores. <laughs> there's the lorry. The captured Japanese forces up the tree, but the nitroglycerine exploded. And the thousand cans of sake? Ooh. <laughs> uh, I'm afraid Blood Knock drank it. Well, I'm sorry, Sigun. No sake, no back pain. What? Heckles, oh. get an empty bucket, quick. Now, grab Blood Knock's ankle. Yeah. Yeah. What's oh. going on here? Hold his head over the bucket. Now, shake him. Come on. Come on. No yeah. sake, no pain. Yeah. 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 Listeners will recall that Bloodnock has not been drinking sake, but nitroglycerin. Therefore... And so ended World War Three. Book now for World War Four. <laughs> Mr. Greenslands, would you mind telling the nice peoples that I have not been dead this way? Certainly. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen... And gentlemen. It is both a privilege and a pleasure to announce... Shut up, Lubbock. Shut up, Lubbock. Shut up. Shut up. A privilege and a pleasure to announce that the lad blue bottle was not deaded this week. Not deaded this week. Here, that was a good game. That was, wasn't it? I like... 
that was The Goon Show, a BBC recorded program featuring Peter Sellers, Harry Seacombe, Spike Milligan, with the Relative Quartet and Max Galbraith. The orchestra was conducted by Wally Stott, script by Spike Milligan and Larry Stevens, announcer Wallace Greenslade, the program produced by Pat Dixon. Oh, you little tell you. You'll get a punch up the cock if you don't belt up, mate. <laughs> Mr. Seagoon, please. Such vulgarity ill becomes you. Nonsense. It throws him down to the ground. What? <laughs> it really is you down to the ground. Baffle me with the posh chap, Mr. Spinks. Now, Mr. Green said, if you'll just stand in this bath of treacle and sit down slowly, you'll come to a sticky end. Hop, hop, two. The dreaded goon show. <laughs> this week. The moon. Show. Yes, folks, it is 1853, the year of months. No giggling, please. Now then, if listeners in the Lincolnshire district will raise their blinds, they will observe the moon casting its painted wooden beams upon a compost heap on which is... On which is found a ragged idiot recumbent upon a field of turnips. He speaks and spokes. Ah, oh, moon! Ah, oh, English type moon! What beauty! What rotundity! What delicacy! What purity! What joy! What rubbish! <laughs> Only ten watts? Well, not very bright, are you? <laughs> the voice came from a face sinister standing up a tree. Sigun held up a board which said, What are you doing up a tree? We are mountaineering on a rather tight budget. <laughs> Allow me to introduce my friend here on the South Col branch. He is, and I quote from the Blue Book of the London Telephone Directory, Count Jim Knees... Moriarty, fruit bottler extraordinary to the house of Pronk, and ex-world Turkish bath champion. Oh, 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 oh. listen, Neddy. We heard your poetry, and it's an insult to people without knees to hear that type of stuff. What, 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 what? As you can say that again, what, 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 Listen, Jim Broody Moriarty. Do you realize you're addressing Neddy Davis Seagoon, celebrated ink writer and tramp poet for East Plum? If you can do better, go ahead. Right, lad. Moriarty, hand me my poet's tin speaking cup. Right. I'll plug it into my knee. There once was a beautiful moon. It was up in the sky, chum. When he said, what's the time? They replied, what? And the horse departed, leaving Spawn. <laughs> It didn't rhyme or scan. Do you think it was easy? <laughs> you see, Neddy, that's known as poetic license. Where can I get a poetic license? Oh, uh, there's just one left in the shop. Here, apron's marked down from six foot three. What a reduction! <laughs> I'll just write you a check on the side of this horse. Right, sign your name across the bottom. <laughs> Whoops! <laughs> there! 
gentlemen. Wait a minute. How do we know this horse won't bounce? I assure you, any reputable stable will catch it. Thank you, Nidhi. And here's our receipt on this banjo. <laughs> thank you and thank you. Now to test my new poetic license. Where's my letter speaking trumpet? <clears throat> ah, moon. You're like a melody type tune. You're so clever you can rhyme with goon. Oh, the boon is the moon in June, the boon. I'll think of another rhyme soon. And in this land of liberty, I'll make my living at poetry. You'll starve. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm afraid, lad, your verse still lacks Browning's merry note. Did he leave one? For the milkman, he did, yes. I... Listen, Neddy, you're very fond of the moon, aren't you? Yes. If only to a mind. Neddy, it can be. Step up into the tree into my office. Morning, Mr. C. Good morning. <laughs> now, Neddy, pull up your trousers and sit down. Neddy, <laughs> the moon has been in Moriarty's family for many generations. Oh. You mean the moon is of French origin? So the blood tests show. Unfortunately, at the uh, end of the last century, during the anti-Moriarty riots in Paris, the dear Count was forced to flee to England, bringing the moon with him. How do we manage that? Uh, I bought it in the daytime, disguised as the sun. Quel brilliant stratagem. Quel terrible pronunciation. What, 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 what? I'm coming to that. Uh, you see, lad, owing to the high cost of maintaining his ancestral bed sitter, Count Moriarty is forced to put the moon on the open market. It's for sale? Only by public auction, lady. Where, when, how, what, who? Yes, well, for reasons best <laughs> known to Moriarty. The auction will take place at dead of night in a tree of crystals. Yes, to build the neddy, our revoir. Which is French for Max Gildred. But, round the back for the old brandy now. Good luck. Right.
And now the Moon Show Part Two, an auction. <laughs> Gentlemen, please. Gentlemen, please. If you will take up your positions in your respective trees, we will commence the auction. Now then, first, one moon, the property of Count Moriarty. Now, oh, what am I paid for one moon? Stop the bidding, there, David. Seven and six. Seven and six. Maybe you can outbid that. Ten shillings. Ten shillings going once. Ten, ten shillings, Neddy. Don't let really him get away with ten that. Ten All right. And Twelve and eleven. It's worth more, Neddy. It's twelve and twelve. Sold at twelve and twelve pence. Oh, my finger. <laughs> now the next item was this explodable bust of anatomy. It's mine. The moon is mine. The moon is mine tonight. Its silvery beam comes down through my window. The moon is mine tonight. It's mine. You'll starve. <laughs> Now, the proud owner of the moon, Seagoon retired to his centrally heated compost heap in Lincolnshire and applied himself to his scheming art. <laughs> now, where's my new roast beef speaking trumpet? <clears throat> no poetry speaker is complete without it. Play testing, testing, one, two, three. Seems all right to me. <clears throat> now. No, oh, 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 now my dreams. How brightly it gleams. What comes next? Hello. Ying Tong, Eagle Eye Paul. Bravo, bravo, lad. Aren't you Neddy under milk pudding, Seagull? Hey, the mother, what are you doing here? I'm Turn Tramp Composer, lad. Well, give us a tune and an instrument. Well, it is only plays if you place a coin in it, you see. And I, uh, I seem to have left my pockets in my other suit. Uh, got, um... Here's a shilling. Oh, ta, yes, fine. Oh, here we go. One, two, three. And the next chance, please. What a beautiful tune that was. Yes, it's number one on the stock exchange, you know. <laughs> I wrote it myself. It was spring and the moon above Paris. Stop, Blood Dog. Moon over Paris. Moon above Paris. Obviously, Moriarty didn't bring the moon over from France in the first place. This one over England must be a forgery. What? <laughs> Well, there's only one way to prove it, lad. Oh, we oh. must consult the Royal College of Astronomers. And to give us time to get there, Tom Danger and his orchestra will play in the pavilion. Let's break up another thought. Yes, it is. <laughs> As Seagoon hurries to the Royal College of Astronomy, awaiting him there are two erudite astronomers who are even at this moment astronomy. <laughs> hey, Professor Eckers. Please, Professor Bottle, my good man. Yes? Let me get on with my mathematical work. Okay, then. Away with you. All right, then. <laughs> Let me say now, computations. I am mathematics. Lower mathematics. X is the point is the unknown quantum. <laughs> X two. Do you think Arsenal will beat the Spurs this week? I should think. I should think it's most unlikely. Why? They're playing Blackpool. <laughs> Yeah, Peter, could you think of moon anywhere? Where must I remember where you put things, my good man? <laughs> Have you looked up the giant telescope? Oh, I'll try that. Yes, I will try that. <laughs> oh, you was right. The moon is inside the telescope. <laughs> Oh, 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 the moon's up the other end, and a bit of the sky, let's put the cap on the end, quick. Oh, goody, goody, we got it tripping. We got it for England. Hold up. Uh, 
That got rid of him. He's gone. Who's gone? <laughs> you have. You naughty boys. What have you done with me? What have you done with me? Oh. What are you... What, what are you doing with the great old British leather telescope? M -m -m we trapped the moon inside it, Professor. What? Let, let me see with a looking type gaze. Get the... My oh, name. men. Oh. They're right. They captured the moon. Oh. Oh. We must put it in the fridge before it goes off. Goes off, Henry? Yes. Didn't you know the moon is made of green cheese? Oh. <laughs> we can have it by supper, Henry. Oh, that's a good idea, Auntie Min. Young bottle. Uh, oh, what are you doing out of bed without your pajama trousers on? <laughs> We was playing from the latest film, Zarek, and little Jim had my pajama trousers over his nut. Oh. He got one arm down the leg, all waving it about like a trunk. He was an elephant, you see. Oh, <laughs> buddy. Well, suddenly he uh, sneezed, and the seat of my trousers fell out, knocking little Jim into the bar. Oh, dear, dear. Little Jim. Little Jim, little Jim. <laughs> What happened, little Jim? Men, <laughs> <laughs> men, get get these adapted children up the bed. You. Shut up, you are not. Good evening. Okay, come in out of the dry and wet yourself by this tap. <laughs> Professor, I want proof that there is only one genuine moon. Ah, oh, there is only one. We've got it trapped in this telescope here. Let me see. <laughs> That's the false one. The real moon is over Paris. What? <laughs> this means war with Napoleon. <laughs> Take the scabbard off my safety pin and fetch my leather horse quickly. <laughs> no, Write him down in his pride. No, your moon. I must go to France and get back my rightful moon. Farewell! Ellington, keep them amused while I'm away. Man, the excuses he makes to get to that brandy. <laughs> Should I kiss your lips and hold you tight? And hold you tight? Is this the way? Is this the way? Is this the way? Is this the way? Or maybe a fool can do. Or maybe a fool can do. But I do now. Is this the way? Never was a lover, one who really cares. But I'm trying, trying to discover. So help me by heavens, by heavens above. Mama 
mama, oh your mama say the fellow, oh your mama, oh your fellow, oh your mama, oh your fellow, oh your mama, oh your mama. Standing. <laughs> Meantime, in the Hotel de Luxe de Super Ritz in Paris. <laughs> Waiter, Garcon. What is it, Monsieur? Uh, Marathi? <laughs> I'm tired of driving this lift, do you hear? I told you that 12 shillings we got off Seagull wouldn't go far. That is mine, Monsieur. Who is who tell me where to sell the bank? Maybe. Goodbye. Moriarty. Shut up, you heavily oiled French wreck. Oh. <laughs> Gentlemen. Gentlemen, what do you mean? It's just a word, Moriarty. Oh. <laughs> Here's a rope for your arrest. Arrest? <laughs> Run for it. Run for it. That's the very horse I wrote the check on. After them, on this pit orchestra. <laughs> Across the length, length, and length of Europe, Sigun pursued the charlatan new vendors. Finally, I traced them to Venice. Ready from left to right, H E L P. Senor, this way. Let me pull you from the wall, sir. Uh, oh, thank you. You saved my life. Well, we all make mistakes, you know. I know. I saw your wife. Now, where are they? Hiding behind the clothes horse in Romania. All right, you do. Come out from behind that clothes horse in Romania. Curse, he's seen us in Romania. The game's up and it fight. Never, Mariotti. Get behind the wheel of these running shoes. Right. All tight, and off we go to the race. Curses. They had the perfect formula for escape. Don't worry, listeners. <laughs> As the criminals in the streamline else, you see pencil sped over the Pont de Rialto. I leapt into English airing cupboard and gave chase. Ah, pick up, Mariachi. Get as quick as I can. Get more power out of those jam tins. I've got all the ones that I can find right now. While the chase is in progress, I should like to take this opportunity of thanking you all for your letters to me. <laughs> Many correspondents have asked why I have not made more significant and prolonged appearances in my role of Wallace Greenslade, Demon Talker. I can assure you that I have approached Mr. Seagoon with regard to taking over his part in the show. He said, uh, well, um, I've got it written down here. Uh, you stick to announcing or you will get a punch up your big steaming conch. <laughs> which, um, which, as you'll all agree, is not the wittiest of lines. <laughs> I will therefore return you to the great Seagoon versus Moriarty grip pipe pin chase, this time with piano accompaniment. Become Moriarty. I say, this is jolly exciting, isn't it? Yes, yes, it is, isn't it, Danny? <laughs> No good grip pipe. These feet I'm using are exhausted. My knees are overheated too. We shall have to catch a train to Tangier. What luck, grip pipe? Here's a sound effect of a booking office. I'll get the ticket. Two cheap day returns to Tangier. You must hurry, Marianne. Even quicker than that. 
Where are those men booked to? They're going to Tangiers. Are they? Yes. I'll book the carriage right behind them and try to overtake them. Porter? Yes, ma'am, yes. Carry me to the train. You look strong enough to carry yourself, sir. Very well. Help me up under my shoulders. Right. <laughs> You've dropped your knees, mate. I can't wait now. Post it to me in the plane map is not knees urgent. Close that thing, will you, Mariate? <laughs> I specially asked for the seat grip pipe with our backs to the engine. I wondered why we were sitting on the cow catcher. Hands up! Stop everything! <laughs> Just as I thought, scrap metal merchants. <laughs> A lifetime of work gone. Now, gentlemen, that moon you saw me was forged. I have it here inside this telescope. Oh, well, now, look here. We are willing to sell you the real moon, but, of course, it, it will work out much dearer. Let me see now. Eight million tons at one and nine ton. That'll be, what, uh, 14 pounds, Nelly. Done! <laughs> now, my moon, please. Let me show you, Nelly. Uh, look, I'll just hold this jam jar up to the sky, get it in the right position. That's it. Now, there. What do you see in it? The moon. The moon, it, it's in the jam jar. Correct, Neddy. <laughs> Goodbye. Oh, no, it's a white. Hooray! The moon is mine! And that is how Mr. Seagoon brought the genuine moon back to England. And a pretty dull ending it was, too.